Our scripture this morning comes out of the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 13, verses 11 through 13. Finally, brothers and sisters, farewell. Put things in order, listen to my appeal, agree with one another, live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit will be with all of you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to Thanks God. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning again, again, and thank you so much for being with us. I want to say thank you to, uh, to uh, Thomas and Devin and Sarah and uh, uh, Christina. Uh, who is, uh, who is uh, filling in for Stephanie this morning. Thank you so much for being here with us, Christine. And of course, uh, Bob Winslow and, uh, and Justin. Well, it's been another rough week, so uh, hopefully we can set all of the, the turmoil aside in our, in our lives and in our nation right now and focus on, uh, focus on our risen Savior for just a few moments and worship together. Uh, on this Trinity Sunday... Uh, on Trinity Sunday, uh, this text that is uh, used a lot is the text that Justin just read in your hearing, uh, the last few verses of, uh, of 2 Corinthians, Paul's letter to the church at Corinthians, his second letter to the church of Corinthians, uh, chapter 13 as we know it, uh, 11 through 13. Uh, uh, Paul uh, mentions, as you have heard, the Trinity, but doesn't, uh, doesn't try to explain what the Trinity is. So uh, I'm not going to do that either. Uh, I'm not going to try to explain either uh, what the Trinity is. Every time ministers do that, they get into trouble and, and enter into some kind of heresy. So uh, I'm not going to do that. But today's passage represents the Apostle Paul's last written words to the Corinthians. These last words are not his last words before dying, but the last urgent words Paul wanted the Corinthians to remember him saying. Now, it helps to remember that uh, some, if not most, of the membership, uh, the Christians uh, of, the, uh, of the Corinthian church were like rebellious teenagers when it came to their spiritual maturity. Uh, they were born and raised in an intensely pagan environment, and they weren't doing well separating themselves from the, their old habits and their old traditions and their old customs that were contrary to this new life they had in Christ. So Paul, so Paul spends a lot of effort and an awful lot of ink uh, offering corrective measures. Um, um, and like many of us who sometimes also act like spoiled teenagers, they didn't appreciate being told what to do. Um, and there was friction between Paul and the church, uh, church members at Corinth. They questioned Paul's spiritual authority over them. They attacked his sincerity to the faith and to his service to God. Uh, and they, were, they said that Paul was crafty and deceitful. Uh, they even said that, uh, that well, he writes, uh, his writing is good, but his, in person he seems weak and his speech is, is contemptible. Uh, they thought he was a good writer but couldn't stand to be around him. Uh, not the kind of feedback that builds confidence for a pastor or a spiritual leader. But, but Paul didn't give up on them. Uh, he didn't ask the bishop to give him a church like Palmasia, uh, where the people are polite and nice to their pastor. No, Paul loved them uh, in spite of the criticism and rejection of his, of his leadership. Now, this is obviously the second letter that Paul had written to the church at Corinth, probably his last. We don't know for sure, but, uh, but he concludes this second letter with, Finally, brothers and sisters, farewell. Farewell. It's not like Paul is saying, you're not going to have me to kick around anymore. Uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's Paul saying, this is it. I'm probably not going to be able to communicate with you again or see you again in this life. So I end with these very important admonitions. Listen to my appeal, Paul says. It's like Jesus when Jesus says, verily, verily, I say unto you, what I'm about to say next is important. Listen to my appeal. He says, put things in order. Now, the better translation for what the New Revised Standard Version has translated uh, into put things in order is 
aim for perfection. Aim for perfection. Other biblical versions translate it, mend your ways. Mend your ways. But Paul is saying, strive for, uh, strive for perfection. Earlier in the chapter, Paul tells them that he's praying that they won't do anything wrong. So contextually, aim for perfection is a good logical choice, a good logical translation. And the Corinthians' response was probably like our response. Wait a minute, Paul. How, how, can, we, how can we be perfect? Uh, that seems a, a little daunting. And Paul's instructions to aim for perfection, or like others, uh, uh, like other uh, directives, in, uh, for instance, from Jesus on the Sermon of the Mount, he said, be perfect as the Heavenly Father is perfect, um, have caused us uh, a, a little dismay. After all, how can, how can one be perfect? Uh, who among us can overcome a strong human nature, uh, overcome our uh, uh, strong human nature and live a perfect life, a perfect Christian life. So, so Christian perfection seems to be something unachievable by we Christians who are also very human. Yet I think Paul is suggesting that we not, we not let what looks like an impossible directive to become a license to sin. In other words, to throw up our hands in defeat and, and say, well, I'll never achieve perfection anyway. Nobody's perfect, so I'm not even going to try that hard anymore. After all, everybody makes these same types of mistakes. But I think Paul's directive here reminds us that while uh, we may be tempted to dismiss all of our moral lapses as mistakes, if we want to follow Jesus faithfully, uh, we've got to move beyond the rationaliza rationalization uh, uh, and saying, well, I am what I am, and I don't see myself changing at this late date. Now, we do make mistakes. Of course we make mistakes. And, and our mistakes can be great teachers if we'll listen to their lesson, if we'll learn their lesson. But we can't equate making mistakes with willful disobedience. To reduce willful disobedience to making mistakes can be a life-threatening, uh, can be life-threatening morally and spiritually. And many have fallen into sin and destroyed their lives and their family by concluding, well, it's just not that big a deal. No one, no one will know but me. A few lines earlier in, his le in this letter, Paul had, had just written, my fear is that if I return to Corinth, I would find that you're still dabbling in sexual immorality and impurity. Now, on the other hand, spiritual perfection does not necessarily mean the absence of sin in our lives. Remember what John said, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And Jesus' words to the accusers of the woman caught in adultery, let, let anyone without sin... Let any of you without sin uh, cast the first stone. But aiming for perfection does mean being honest with ourselves about sin, acknowledging our willful disobedience, repenting of it, asking for forgiveness when sin leads down a path that's not following Jesus. Acknowledgement is, is confession, and repentance is turning away from, from that sin and, for, and, asking, and then asking forgiveness from God. Perhaps that's why Paul writes in, this, in his last words to the Corinthians to aim, aim for perfection. There's a sense that God wants us to be moving in the direction that leads to perfection. Who among us can can say we've achieved the highest level of spiritual maturity and there's nothing else that we can do uh, to live a more Christ-like life. It's more important to be asking ourselves, are we moving in the direction of loving our neighbors and forgiving our enemies and showing compassion to the poor and doing kingdom restoration work? Am I growing in my faith daily? Am I being transformed into a faithful follower of Christ? Well, I think that's what Paul meant when he encouraged the Corinthians uh, and us to aim, to aim for perfection. 
And then Paul went on to say, agree with each other. Agree with each other. Be of one mind, as it's translated in other versions. Agree with each other. Well, this seems as impossible, uh, uh, even more impossible than aiming for perfection. Agree with each other. Agree with each other. Now, we need to qualify that in this context, Paul is writing to, uh, writing to and speaking to the church, uh, to the Christians in Corinth. Uh, who really couldn't get along with each other, and that's the reason Paul's saying this, couldn't get along with Paul, couldn't get along with each other, but he's not writing to non-believers. But even, even uh, limiting this directive to, uh, to the churchgoers seems to be another mission impossible. Paul would probably go into cardiac arrest if he could see the church today. And the church today in the U.S., uh, anyway, there seems to be as many different opinions among Christians as there are personality or people, personalities, personalities or people. The fact uh, uh, there are so many different denominations in the U.S., uh, uh, Christian denominations, seems to indicate that, that unity about anything in the church is humanly impossible. Unity in the church seems to be as difficult as, as spiritual, uh, spiritual uh, perfection. Aiming, to, aiming for perfection. Of course, there's, there's going to be different opinions in the church and we value uh, a freedom of, of thought and freedom of Christian expression. But when you think about it, many churches uh, were launched because they split off of another church because they couldn't, couldn't agree on the color of the new carpet um, or the new preacher or the new building. And maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's a good thing. I don't know. Maybe, how, maybe that's how the church spreads across, across the world. Christians hold different opinions. And of course, there are some core beliefs of our faith that all Christians should believe and live by. And Paul would want us to agree on, uh, with each other on those essential beliefs. John Wesley said in, in essentials, there ought to be unity. In non-essentials, liberty with each other. And in all things, a charity. And if we, the church, are going to be effective at reaching and having an impact on a sharply divided world and sharply divided nation for Christ, we must be unified. We must be unified with our expressions of faith and our expressions of love and our expressions of compassion. And just before Paul says, greet each other with a holy kiss, which uh, uh, Paul evidently didn't foresee uh, uh, a practice of social distancing brought on by a coronavirus pandemic. A holy kiss. We can't even get within six, six feet of each other. So all of the holy kisses when we do begin to worship together are, are, are going to have to be put on hold at least for a while. We can't even shake hands and hug. So we're certainly not going to be able to give each other a holy kiss on the cheek. But just before just before Paul says, greet each other with a holy kiss, he says, listen to my appeal. Live in peace. Live in peace. Which, given the state of our nation today, living in peace just doesn't seem to be humanly possible. This is an extremely difficult time and a painful time in our nation uh, as our nation, uh, as grief and anger are erupting over the senseless, senseless death of George Floyd. But radical elements in our society are exploiting the grief and drowning out the voices of peaceful protest in order to incite chaos in our society. And now there are 15 or 16, maybe 17 more, uh, more dead persons because of, because of the chaos and rioting. One is a pol retired police officer Another one is a, a, an officer of the Department of Homeland, uh, Homeland Security. Another is a, a girl who was trying to participate peacefully but got caught in, a violent, in, in the violent rioting. Businesses have been, uh, uh, many owned by mi minorities have been looted and burned. Living in peace, given the state of our nation, seems impossible. And maybe that's why Paul wrote in this letter to the Church of Rome, so far as that depends on you, so far as that depends on you, live peaceably with all. 
So far as that depends on you, Paul recognizes that there are some things that we cannot control in this world and cannot change, but he also recognizes that, that there are some things and some people that we can have an impact on. So far as it depends on you, Christian, live peaceably with all. There will be forceful struggles between good and evil in the world. But so far as it depends on you, we should do everything we can to be at peace with all. And then Paul's last, last words, his last, last words, his final words in these last words, he calls for the grace of Jesus, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit to be with the Corinthians and now also with us. And although, all know, although, we know these words best as, as a benediction, and most of us pastors use this benediction in, in, in some form. It's, it's more than a nice ending to the letter. Uh, it's more than sentiments about the, about, the, uh, uh, about the Trinity. Rather, it could be that Paul knows that aiming for perfection, unity, and living in peace with all which which all our values of the kingdom of God are all quite impossible in our own strength and if we attempt these on our own with our own strength alone there's a good chance we'll end up uh, uh, defeated and discouraged in our faith and Paul knew that the Christians at Corinth uh, would need something uh, rather they would need someone greater than themselves Paul knew what and who uh, was needed to empower them and to empower us to keep us faithful and engaged in pursuing these kingdom values, perfection, uh, unity, living in peace with one another. And so in, this, in his very last, last words, his final last words to the Christians at Corinth, Paul invokes the power of the blessing and the fellowship of God expressed through the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as the vital ingredient, the vital ingredient to making these impossible kingdom values possible in and through our lives today. It was true for the Christians at Corinth and it is true for us today.